I have good news to bring, and that is why I sing all my joy with you. I like to share. I'm gonna take a trip in the good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. Spend my time in prayer And when that ship comes in Gonna leave this world of sin And go sailing through the air I'm gonna take a trip In the middle of Oh yes, I'm going With Christ, I am an heir. Too much fault you find, you're gonna surely be left behind. I'll go sailing through the air. Spend my time in prayer And when that ship comes in Gonna leave this world of sin And go sailing through the air I'm gonna take a trip In the good old gospel ship I'm going far me far beyond the sky Gonna shout and sing until while I'm bidding this world goodbye Oh, I'm gonna take, take a trip in the good old gospel ship I'm going far beyond the sky Oh, I'm gonna shout, shout and sing until heaven's ring While I'm bidding this world goodbye I'm gonna take a trip in the gospel ship, yes, I'm going, going far be, far beyond the sky. I'm gonna shout and sing until the heavens ring while I'm bidding this world goodbye. I'm gonna take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far be, far beyond the sky. Shout and sing until the heavens ring while I'm bidding this world goodbye.
ministry. These kids, or just a few of them, sitting up here, but they're just as important as if there's a thousand. If you can save one soul, it's worth more money can buy. I'm proud to see those little kids up here. And then Campbell, I believe is her name, Betty. Is that right back here? Come on the bus. Yes. Is your last name Campbell? Well, we're glad to have you. You've been here before. You were brought by your granddaughter, I believe it was. But uh, maybe your daughter. But anyway, we're glad to have you with us. And don't give up on this bus ministry. The, the beginning is tough. You know, a, a baby doesn't come out playing a saxophone. Jumps out of the womb. Tim Jr. <laughs> no, 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 no. It has to grow. This bus ministry has to grow. And, and it will. It will because we're going to support it and we're going to pray for it. And we're not going to be discouraged. It's got its negatives, a lot of them. But everything has negatives. But there's some positives. I want to see God do it. Marakota Mashanamai. Whoo, I said the Holy Ghost can move. Worship God as he come to sing. Just had to blunder a little bit there. I do blunder sometimes, you know. What is that word blunder? <laughs> it means you make mistakes sometimes. But God bless you. Appreciate you. He brought me out. He brought me out of the fiery furnace. He brought me through. And he brought me through the raging sea. He taught me how to ever trust him. And now I have. And now I have sweet victory. He brought me out. He brought me out of the fire. with Jesus and have his love forevermore. He brought me out. Now he brought me out of the fiery furnace. He brought me through. And he brought me through the raging sea. He taught me My dear Jesus, for he will never leave my side. He Just bow before him down on your knees. You can be sure that he will hear and he will answer. He'll give you peace and joy with him.
Man, I'm proud of you folks. I'm proud of the Lord. I thank God that we can keep climbing higher. You don't get to a level and stop. It just keeps on going. It's like the sky. There's no limit to God. If we'll just follow him, everything will be all right. Amen. Everybody stand, if you will, please be here tonight for service. I'm looking forward to it. I believe God's going to meet with us. And it's good to see those that are getting saved. We need to have a water baptismal service. If you got saved recently, you need to be baptized in water. We've had numbers to say they got saved. Sister Amanda, good to see you back with us. Amen. She looks good, don't she? God's blessed you. you got a good smile. I tell you, God will change you. I said, God will change you. And if you don't get changed, you haven't found God. You can go around telling everybody you're saved all you want to. That don't prove anything. What proves it is how you live. There's a change. Whoo. <laughs> I said, there's a change. Amen. Turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Two verses of scripture. You that are watching the internet, Facebook, trust that you'll be blessed as you hear the word of God this morning. Amen. We're praying for you. If you need God, you just turn to the Lord where you are. He'll help you. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 and 16. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll help us this morning as we endeavor to preach your gospel. Touch every person here. Those that are watching the internet. Bless our people that are not able to be here. Those that are sick and afflicted. Bless the service tonight. And touch us then and every time we assemble together. But right now we're here this morning. Bless the altar service. Save the lost and heal and deliver. Oh my God. Help us to preach. I depend on you this morning. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. I say that about every time, but I want you to give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Let me read it one more time. Two verses of scripture. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm going to minister on the subject, no time for doubt. And before I start the message, I'll have three or four messages that I'm going to preach no time for doubt. I've got no time for discouragement, no time for division. I'll be preaching a series of sermons here, just a few on this, but this morning I'm preaching on no time for doubt. And we want God to touch us. You can let me read the scripture again one more time. Ephesians 5 15 and 16. So then see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as rise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And you can be seated if you will, please. No time for doubt. Time is very essential to the individual, time is precious. The way you sit, spend your time is important. We're to walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm speaking on no time for doubt, redeeming the time, buying the time. That word redeem means purchase a time. Make the time valuable. Use it wisely. No time for doubt. The word doubt, according to Webster, means a lack of confidence in. It means distrust. It means uncertain. It's an indication that you have not accepted what God says and what God produces. So we don't need to do that. We need to believe what God said since we understand doubt and what it is. Not accepting, refusing it, not believing what God said. We must be careful concerning this enemy. We must not let doubt have a part in our lives. We must believe although it looks hard. We must believe, although it looks like it'll never happen, because we're trusting God and God created something out of nothing. He made everything that exists. There's procreation and there's creation. God created everything out of nothing, but then there's procreation made out of something. But our God made us, made man in the beginning. He created all things. It's easy to doubt if we listen to Satan. If Eve would have never listened to Satan, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in here today. Sin is rampant, the devil's loose, and the power of hell is working throughout 
the world. And not only throughout the world, the power of the devil is trying to work in the church. But because Eve doubted God, she took the fruit and threw everything into chaos. But it's going to get better. It may get worse and will get worse. As we heard in our Sunday school lesson today, evil times and evil seducers and men and women are going to get worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But we're not of that crowd. We don't believe like they do. We have another Savior. We have a master that's over us. But those whose time is occupied in following God, have no time to doubt. Well, how do you get rid of doubt? You gotta read the word. You gotta be faithful. You gotta feed the spiritual man. If you're loose and you're living and you're not committed the way you need to be committed, you are not going to be up to par spiritually. But we need to be on fire. Because God word, God's word declares unto us that if we're lukewarm, he'll spew us out of his mouth. We will make him sick. We will give him nausea. But there's no time to doubt. Jesus had been raised from the dead by the power of God. And Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and Jesus wasn't there. And she goes back to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And here's what she said. She said, they have taken away my Lord. She made it personal. And I'm going to say a little bit about that just a a little while from now. They've taken away my Lord and I know not where they've laid him. Well, they were very excited about it. They dropped what they were doing because Jesus was the most important thing that ever happened in their life. They loved him so much. He comforted them with his words. He healed their sick. He gave them promise beyond this life. He gave them hope. They were lifted in their spirit. They knew him. And they were disappointed that he wasn't around. But all they had left was his body. And now his body's gone. But a dead body doesn't do anybody any good. Jesus died, but he wasn't going to stay dead. And I'm going to tell you, I can die here tonight and leave this world and you could put me in a casket and roll me down here in the front and you can come and talk to me all day long and I'm not going to answer you because I'm dead, I'm gone. I've gone on to be with the Lord. Jesus had died on the cross, but Mary was so concerned about his body and those disciples ran back to that tomb and they saw the body of Jesus was missing and they saw the, uh, where he had lain and the garments that he had on and a napkin wrapped to itself, another place. The John came and he looked in. He didn't go in, but Simon Peter looked into the sepulcher and saw that napkin wrapped in another place by itself, peculiarly. Now somebody tells me, and I don't know that this is true or not, but I've heard this, that in those days, if, if a waitress would uh, be there, maybe serving somebody food, and they had a napkin, they'd wrap. If the person would get up and absent themselves, that they were going to come back, they'd wrap their napkin a certain way, and that waiter or waitress would know they're coming back. Well, it makes a little sense that with that napkin that was about Jesus' head being wrapped a certain way, was speaking a message to them: "I'm coming back. The tomb is empty." But I'm coming back. And they looked in. And Peter went in and investigated. And then they left and went back. And Mary Magdalene sat there weeping. And she weeped. She saw two angels, one at the foot and one at the head of where the body of Jesus had lain. And of course, she was weeping. And the angels said unto her, Why weepest thou? They've taken away the Lord. Now, I said there first, she said, My Lord. But now she said they've taken away the Lord and I know not where they've taken him. And uh, Jesus was there and spoke unto her her name. And she didn't know it was Jesus. He was behind her. And he said to her, woman, why weepest thou? Uh, What meanest thou? Why are you weeping and crying? They've taken away the Lord. She supported in the garner. He said, Mary. And when he said that word, she said, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. 
He said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but I ascend to my Father and your, and your Father and to my God and your God. Go tell the brethren that, that I was sent back to heaven. She went and she, she told the story of what had happened. And I'm relating to the message here, doubting, no time to doubt. Thomas wasn't there. When Jesus was there and the rest of the disciples said, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, except I put my, in his hands, I see the print of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the prints and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I've got to see this for myself. And so Jesus had come back on the eighth day and he said to, to Thomas, reach hither, thy, behold my hands, and reach hither your finger, and thrust your hand into my side. Said, and Thomas did, and he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord said, you've seen me. He said, my Lord and my God. He said, you've seen me, but blessed are they which have not seen me. Yet they believe, and did, Jesus did many signs in that day and until the, the things were written about what he did, they weren't written if they were all that he did, but he did them that they might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing they might have life through him. Everything Jesus did, but Thomas was doubting. No time to doubt. We have no time to doubt our own experience. We need to live to where we can have faith in ourselves. I know that we have to have faith in God, but I know that we cannot doubt our own Christian life. I know who I am. I know when I got saved. I know my weaknesses and I know my failures. I know when I've missed God. I know that I'm human and I have problems with the flesh. I know I have to fight the fight of faith. I have to lay hold on eternal life. But I have confidence in my spiritual experience. I know who I am. I know when I approach God, there's nothing in the way. And I can have a clear line to glory. When I need to pray, I can call on God and Jesus will be there. We don't need to doubt our experience. Doubt will cause you to lose your standing with God, your own personal life. It'll destroy your relationship with God. In Romans 14, 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Thomas said, I got a seam. And when he did, he believed. But I've never seen him. You've never seen him. But I know him. Well, how do I know him? I found him from Genesis to Revelation. How do I know him? I pray that he's in the right hand of the Father and he's making intercession for me. He's sharing me when I pray. How do I know him? He came into my life and changed me. I'm a born again believer. How do I know him? I'm sanctified by the blood. I'm separated from this world. My name is written down in heaven. How do I know him? I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives me victory and utterance to talk. I know him. I know him. I've got confidence in myself. Well, how come you have confidence in myself? I've examined myself. Second Corinthians 13 and 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Not your own, no, know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except to be reprobate. I've got confidence in my prayers. I've got confidence in my experience, not in the flesh. No flesh can stand in the presence of God. No flesh can please God. My confidence is through the, the mediation of him at the right hand of the Father. My confidence is in the Holy Ghost that I feel when I worship, when I preach, when I witness, when I do the things of God. I have confidence. I don't doubt my experience. I know I'm saved. I don't care if Jesus comes right now. I'm ready to go. If I wasn't, I'd get right before the service was over. We can't afford to doubt. 
We must not doubt our experience. There's a difference in the devil talking to you and you believe in those lies. You got to put him on the road. Neither give place to the devil, but give place to the Lord. We must not doubt that our sins are forgiven. We must believe they're gone. I know they're gone. I can't explain it. I don't have any problem with believing there's a heaven. I don't have any problem believing there's a hell. I don't have any problem believing in my Christian experience. I know it. I know it. Matatapahaya. Mashananai. You can never talk me out of it. You can never make me doubt it. The old soul song goes, you can't make me doubt it. It's real, I'm going to shout it. You can't make me doubt it. We must believe they're gone or else they'll hang on. I know I'm saved. I don't doubt it. Psalm 103 and 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. It's wonderful to be without a conscience of guilt. Wonderful to be pure and holy, knowing you're walking right, knowing if the trumpet sounds you're leaving, not worrying about what other people are doing to the extent that you let that get in your spirit. You must carry your own load. You must have your own fountain. You must have your own experience. What other men do, God will, they'll be accountable unto God. But I must make sure I don't doubt my own experience. Some of you may do that. Well, you're not where you need to be then. When you start asking God for something, it's easy to doubt it if the devil's talking, but you've got to press beyond doubt. You've got, got to believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe he's going to bring you out of the valley. You must look, and you'll see that he's a lily of the valleys. You must understand you have God and you don't need anything else. You have Jesus, and you claim that experience, and you stand on it. Don't doubt it, Psalm 78 and 38. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. He could have taken the people in the Old Testament and could have destroyed many of them. But the Bible said he was full of compassion. He forgave their iniquities. All you got to do is confess it. Believe it. Receive it. Don't make excuses for your shortcomings. Search your heart and, and realize what you are and who you are. And apply everything the way it needs to be applied by the word of God. Let God help you. Because there's going to be people in the Pentecostal church that are going to miss the rapture. Because they don't have what they ought to have. Micah 7 and 19 said he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That word subdue in Hebrew means to bring into bondage, to keep under subjection. He will subdue our iniquities. We don't have to doubt our experience. You can never make me doubt it. I've got it. I've got it every day. I've got it in the morning. I've got it in the noon time. I've got it at night. And you have it. Don't let the devil rob you of it. He's a stealer. He's a killer. He's a robber. He's a destroyer. Don't let him have it. Colossians 2 and 13, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgive you all trespasses. I don't doubt my experience. I don't doubt my sins are gone. We must not doubt his power that is within us. We must not doubt what he can do. We've seen him do it in the past, and we know he did it. You can testify what he did. You can talk about the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, how God worked mightily. You can talk about how good the church was when you were coming up as a young person. You're up in age now. It was a lot different than it is now. But a lot of changes take place. Most of them not for the good, for the negative. But you can't, 
lose your power because somebody else fails God. When my mom and dad forsake me, David said, then the Lord will take me up. I've got to have that experience. I must not sin against God. He must be gone. And I must not doubt his power. We are promised his power. And we're promised that it will keep us. We must not allow doubt to destroy that power. Moses faced it in the wilderness when he sent out those spies to go out and view the land of Canaan. God had already told them. They had been taught it from a child. They were taught it in the land of Egypt. Canaan was theirs. They were in Egypt not to stay there. But they were there for a period of time and God's going to bring them out. And he sent Moses to bring them out. They saw miracles and signs and wonders. They saw the Red Sea open and they walked through. They saw Moses smite the rock and water came out. They saw the manna come down from heaven. They saw the mighty hand of God as he destroyed enemies before them. But yet... They could not believe, and many of them were a mixed multitude, and they doubted God after what God had done. It's hard to doubt God. Somebody said it's hard to believe, not if you're a real Christian. It's hard to doubt. How can I doubt God? When he brought me out of the miry clay and he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a song. My God, he gave me praise unto my God. It's hard to doubt if you really know him. It's hard not to believe. But they had seen all these miracles. And they still had doubters among them. There's some doubters maybe sitting here today in this congregation. Keep the right spirit. Keep the love of God. Keep the power of God. Make sure your own experience is up to par and then you'll have power with God and doubt will have no place in your life. God sent those spies out, 12 of them. Each one represented a tribe of Israel. And he said, I want you, Moses, and God said uh, through Moses, uh, go up and view the land and the land of Canaan and see the land and the people that dwell therein, where they're strong or weak or whether few or many see the land. And then he said, I want you to look at the cities, whether they dwell in tents or strongholds, and if the land's good or bad or fat or lean, and if there's any wood in it, and bring the fruit of the land back. He sent 12 spies out, and they went up to the south and came to Hebron, and they met the sons of Anak, Hyman, Shishay, and Talmai. They met them there, but they saw the fruit of the land and their eyes began to pop open. God had promised them a land of good and plenty where the milk and the honey flows. And when they got there, they saw the grapes and they were so big until they get a cluster of them and they had to put them on a staff and it took two to carry them. One stood on one end of the staff and the other on the other end and they carried the grapes at Esco where they were. And then there were pomegranates and figs And they called the name of the place Esco because of the cluster of grapes. They were so big. And they returned after 40 days to the camp there in Kadesh in Paran. And they showed them the fruit of the land. I want to tell you, when we get to heaven, God's going to see our fruit. He's going to see what we're holding, what we've got. And he's going to say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, nobody's going to rob you. Nobody's going to take what you've got because God has a record. They brought the fruit of the land as evidence. I want to tell you, if you're serving God, there's going to be some evidence of faith. There'll be evidence of power. There'll be evidence of love. And there'll be evidence of compassion. There'll be evidence of victory if you serve God. So they had the fruit of the land there that they brought and they told them said we came whether you sent us and said boy it is a land of milk and honey you weren't just joking 
It floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the, the p- place there, the people are strong, and they that dwell in the cities, and they're walled. And we saw the sons of Anak there. Uh, uh, Hyman, Shishay, and, and Talmi saw those sons of Anak there and uh, said, uh, uh, the Canaanites said, uh, they dwell, but Jordan and the Amalekites dwell in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites uh, and, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And, and Caleb stilled the people while they were talking. There were more doubters than they were believers. Listen to me. There be more sinners than they are Christians. There be more doubters than they will believers. But that doesn't stop God's spirit. That doesn't stop the fruit. That doesn't counsel God's promise. I don't care if everybody doesn't believe. That doesn't stop me from eating the grapes. I'm going to eat the grapes. I'm going to have the pomegranates and the figs. I'm going to feast on God. If my neighbor does it fine, if mom and dad does it good, but I'm drinking water out of my own fountain and rivers of water out of the river of life, I'm drinking out of my own well. I have my own experience. He said, let's go up and take it right now. The doubters said, we're not able to take it. They're stronger than we are. And there's giants in the land. And said, the land we went to search it is a land that eaten up the inhabitants thereof. And giants are there. The sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were on a, in our own sight, grasshoppers. So were we in their sight. And when they heard this talking going on between the believer and the unbeliever, the doubter, we can't go. Caleb says, we can. Listen to me. Your life is going to influence somebody. You're either going to influence them for good or you're going to influence them for bad. The doubters have more followers than the believers. It's always been that way. Jesus said, few there be that be saved. I'm not looking to the numbers. I'm looking to the quality and not the quantity. There were many there. When they heard that evil report, that report of doubt, they they began to weep and cry. And the people wept all night long. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said, Would to God we'd died in Egypt. Would to God we'd uh, died in the wilderness. Said, Wherefore? Have you brought us out here that we should fall by the sword the Lord has? Blame the Lord that our wives and our children should be a prey. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Caleb and Moses and Aaron and Joshua heard what they're saying. And Moses and Aaron fall on their face. And Caleb began to talk unto the people. And he said, the land with which we went to search, it's a good land. But he said, we passed through it, and we, it's a exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, he'll bring that land, and he'll give it unto us. A land that is ours, it's ours. Don't rebel, for these people are bred for us. Their uh, uh, defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. They said, stone them with stones. Isn't it the same way today when you believe the whole gospel, when you live a sanctified life, you've got people in the church with a stoning spirit, stone them with stones. Christians are persecuted and other religions don't get any persecution. How come? Because it's the only religion of the world that gives life. It's the only one that can do anything. When they said stone them with stones of glory, the Lord appeared at the tabernacle out there. And stopped that, and God got angry. And he said, how long are these people going to provoke me? With all the signs and wonders they've seen, now they're doubting me. No time to doubt. Why are they doubting? Look what I've done for them. Look how blessed them. I brought them out of bondage. They were slaves. I brought them through the Red Sea, and I drowned the Pharaoh's army. I fed them with man and clothed them, and here they are doubting me. And he said to Moses, he said, I'm going to smite them with a pestilence. I'm going to kill them, and I'm going to disinherit them, disinherit them. And I will make of you a great nation. You'll be greater than they are. Moses could have said, well, that sounds awful good to me. You're going to make me greater than I am. I'm already pretty good. 
I've put out the rod and I've seen all this stuff going on. All these miracles are happening. And you're going to make me great. Now i get to work. God, kill them all. They deserve it. They're doubters. They deserve to be killed. But he said, no, Lord. The Egyptians are going to hear this. They'll hear how uh, you brought them up out of Egypt and how you brought them out here into this wilderness. And, tell the, and they'll tell the inhabitants of the land about it for they've heard that you're seen face to face and your cloud is with them. You're leading them in the cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they'll hear this. And if you kill this people as one man, all of these nations uh, are going to hear about it and uh, of your fame. And they'll speak saying because he was not able to take them into the promised land, he's brought them out here to kill them. What was Moses saying? Moses was saying the people are more important than I am. He didn't have any kind of attitude to edify himself. He didn't say, well, that sounds good. Just make me what you're saying. You're going to make me. I deserve it. I stood the test. I've been what I ought to be. No, he was concerned about the people. He was concerned about the name of God. Let me tell you something. Before you commit a sin, before you go into a trial and you obey the temptations of the devil, before you do wrong, you need to consider what you're going to do to yourself. People commit adultery and never get away from it. It's a scar that will never be wiped away. God may forgive it, and he does. You can still go to heaven, but you'll never be the same. People are going to remember it, and the devil's going to try to see to it that they remember it. So you need to understand your sins, and the sins that you commit are not just your own sins. They affect your family. They affect the church. They affect people on the job. You've been going to church to the job and telling them you're a member of the Dallas Church of God and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you know God and then the next thing you know you're committing sin and adultery and fornication and uncleanness. What are you doing? You're bringing reproach on the name of God and that's what Israel was doing in the wilderness when they were doubting God and they said we can't take it. I'm telling you don't have to go out and sin and do something terribly wrong to bring reproach on God. When you doubt God, you are blaming God and you're telling God He's not God, but I want to tell you, He's God in the Father. He's God in the Son. He's God in the Holy Ghost. He's always God. So Moses says, He'll say, You brought him out here. And Moses prays a prayer of repentance for him. He said, I don't want you to take him, I don't want you to kill him. But God, listen to Moses. And God told him He was going to pardon them. But he said, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. But he said, because of these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have tempted me these ten times and have not hearkened, surely they'll not see the land. There were those who were killed with peasants. But they're not going in. Except Caleb. He followed me fully. Doubters are not going in. If you doubt, you'll never see anything in your household that's blessed of God. If this church has a spirit of doubt, we'll never see the Holy Ghost move. We got to have two things to really please God. Faith, actually three, faith, hope, and charity. We got to believe God and we got to love God. We got to love his truth. We got to love his holiness. We must love one another and we must have hope. We have hope. Their hope was a Canaan land. But they weren't going to let a doubters keep them out. I'm not going to let doubters keep me from preaching the word. I can't help what other preachers preach. I can't help what other churches uh, live for. I'm responsible for the Dallas Church of God. I must preach the truth. I must preach against sin and the devil. I must preach faith in God. All things are possible to him that believeth. 2 Timothy 1 and 12, For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He's able to keep it. Jude 24, and unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with eternal joy. Whoo! He's able to keep you from falling. No time to doubt. The Bible said he'll present you faultless. That word faultless in Greek means unblemished, without blame, unblameable. Psalm 121, 4 and 5, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall not slumber. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite neither by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee 
from evil. The Lord shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forever. The Lord shall preserve thee. Whoo! I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it because I don't doubt my experience. I don't doubt what I've been given. I'm not puffed up in pride about it. I'm humbled because of it. But I see the King of Kings filling the glories. I see the King of Kings filling the heavens. I see him. Uh, the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. I see him as a creator of all things. I see him that will see me through the darkness. I, my God, I'm a shatalayato. I see him that will bring me into the light. I see him with my failures still loves me anyhow. All I have to do is fight that devil, fight that doubt, believe what God said, and God will supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus the Lord. We must believe we're ready and practice the faith that we have day by day living for God. No time to doubt. No time to doubt your experience. No time to doubt your salvation. We have no time to doubt if we're to help others. But our brother's keeper. There are those who are leaning on us, and we must believe not only for ourselves, but for them. Romans 15 and 1 We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 9 22 To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might be, that I might by all means save some. We're to bear the infirmities of the weak. That's our responsibilities. We have no time to doubt when we consider, when we consider the hour we're living in. We can see it all around us. Brother Bowling was teaching this morning in our class and did a, a, a wonderful, glorious uh, thing for God there, and God be the glory. And he's talking about what we're seeing all over. There's an attack on Christians. There's an attack on the churches. There will be laws that will be passed. Not we didn't know them when we come up. The church was the church when I came up and it had authority in society. But now the church doesn't have any authority anymore because most of the church don't live right. There's too many doubters in the church. Few believers. We see it all around us. We see the signs of the time that are coming upon us. Paul told Timothy, he told him, in the last days there'll be perilous times. I quoted this scripture the other day. He talks about the evil days in which we're living in and what's happening in the world today. He said in 2 Timothy 4 and 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. And his kingdom preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but for their own lust they will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall judge me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I love his appearing. I know what I've got. I know what I've got. I love his appearing. Quietly. I love his appearing. Don't you? Paul said in Second. Thessalonians 2 and 1, I believe it is, but of the times and seasons, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves, no perfect that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Amen. He's coming soon. Don't you believe he's coming? When they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape, but you're not in darkness, that that day shall overtake you as a thief. You're our children of the day, and a ch children of light and children of the day. You're not of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Whew. I'm looking for him. I believe he could come today. I believe he could come this morning. Brother, it's quick. I'm telling you, we're in a mess. They're talking about nuclear war. Can you imagine what a nuclear weapon will do to a city? 
If they hit us with a nuclear weapon, we won't get out of this church. There'll be dead bodies everywhere. The Bible talks about tribulation like it's the worst time man has ever known. But we're not worried about tribulation because we're not going through it. We might have some things that'll be pretty bad, but I don't believe we're going through the wrath of God. When Jesus is going to turn this world upside down and the Jews are going to get in such a mess until they'll say he's the one, the one we pierced, the one we killed. He's the one. We've rejected him. But now we know who the king is. And they're going to cry out unto him. He's coming back and they're going to say, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When the Antichrist tries to annihilate them and destroy them, Jesus is coming to fight their battle. And when they see him, they're going to cry, Hosanna. And in one moment of time, there's going to be born again all the Jews. A nation will be born in a day. That wasn't talking about a natural nation. That was talking about a spiritual nation. We'll be born in a day. And we're living in the closing hours of time. No time to doubt. I believe what I've got. I don't want to change. Well, how come? Because I'm happy with what I've got. I'm not switching. I'd rather fight than switch. I'm not debating. I have no reason to change. Because what I've got works. It's worked for uh, almost 60 years. It's still working. <laughs> 58 years. Stand to your feet, if you would, please. You need to not doubt God and every one of you in this church this morning as I stop this service or make this altar call. This message I stop. You need to search your heart honestly with integrity and make sure you're not doubting God. Make sure you're keeping His promises. Make sure you're faithful to Him. You ought to be in church every service unless you're working a job and you can't be here. And if you can't be here because of a job, God needs to give you another job. The church is the most important place in your life outside the home and they run together. What is in the home will be in the church. If the home isn't right and doesn't have victory, there won't be any victory in the church because you're bringing your doubts and your confusions and, and, and your lifestyle to the church. But most of you love God. Are you ready for the rapture? Are you doubting God? Are you doubting there's going to be a rapture? Are you doubting there's going to be a tribulation period? The Bible says it is. And you could take revelation and symbolically you could try to explain it. But a lot of it is literal. It's not symbolically because if it's symbolical all of it, you can put your own interpretation to it. But there's a lot of it that's literal. It's going to happen. Father, I've done my best to deliver the message that you gave me this morning. I know I'm repetitive at times, but I can only preach what you give me. I pray that you'll bless this congregation. Touch everyone here. Let everyone have an old time experience. Let everyone know you in the fullness of your power. Let everyone be blessed. Let everyone have a right attitude toward themselves and toward their fellow man. Don't let them be down on themselves. Let them realize they're, they're the apple of your eye. There's somebody. You call us out of darkness and it was your marvelous light. You brought us into the kingdom. We're kingdom kids. We're priests. Unto God and to His Christ. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth your praises that call us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Woo! If you're not saved this morning, I'm going to give you an altar opportunity to come and pray. If you're backslid, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and pray. If you're cold and you're not where you ought to be, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and pray. Are you searching? I want to say this one more time, and we're going to pray right now. I'm going to say this one more time. Sister Coggins made a great statement. I mean, it's a valid statement. If the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? You might not be able to have Wednesday night service. Some of you don't come on Wednesday night. Some don't come on Sunday night. 
Some don't come to prayer meeting. Of course, that's, I'm not getting into that. You do what you want to there. That's you and the Lord. But I believe if we'd pray more, we'd come to these prayer meetings, more people show up, we'd see greater things. But I'm not scolding you. I'm just telling you how I feel. Is it all right? I'm just telling you how I feel. I want you to feel this altar this morning. You need God. Whatever you need, I want you to cry out to Him. He's going to answer your prayers this morning. He's going to answer your prayers this morning. He's going to answer your prayers this morning. God's going to answer your prayers this morning. <clears throat> I said God's going to answer your prayers this morning. You're going to touch heaven. Heaven's going to touch you. You're going to give it to God. Whatever it is that's bothering you, it's going to disappear. It's going to leave you. It's not staying. It can't stay. It's gone. In the name of Jesus. Whoo! She called him a hottie, a cotea. I want you to talk to the Lord about yourself and your children and your family and everything going on around you. Tell God to always help you to have faith. It's going to be a battle because you have to fight to have faith. You have to study the word to have faith. You have to be faithful to the church to have faith. You have to love your neighbor to have faith. All of these things. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. My blessed God, let the holy fire of Pentecost permeate this congregation today. Bless my brother. Anoint him of the Messiah. In the Messiah. Touch my brother God in the holy Messiah. Touch my brother Shananai. Shanananai. Touch these that drive a good distance, God. Coming out here to be with us. Oh God, have your way right now and come against every enemy, every demon, every doubt. I'm going to preach on these other things too, God, but you're going to help us because you're God and you're the authority, you're the power, you're the glory. God, touch my sister. We appreciate her, Lord. We appreciate her. Bless her heart. Bless my brother, God. Bless this little angel. Thank you for her life, God. This is a gift of God to this family. We thank you. Shadamo, shadamo, shadamo. God's going to move in your life and you're going to see the hand of God. Sadadamo, sadadamo, tadamai. Woo! Hallelujah. Touch my brother God. We're so proud of him and his life. What he is to us. And a great blessing to us, God. He's a wonderful man. Touch brother Dennis. We thank you for his life, God. We thank you for his commitment. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that baptized him. Thank you for calling him to teach that class. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for my brother, God. Touch him in the Holy Ghost and help him right now. Let him know your power and your glory and your victory. Touch his family. Hallelujah. Oh, God bless Brother Todd. Anoint him as he teaches from time to time. And open doors for him. God, he's your servant. He loves you. Thank you for what you've done for Cassie, God, and Michelle and that family. I've been praying for them for years and I'm looking for victory to come. I'm looking for salvation to be brought and deliverance to be theirs in a meaningful way. And it will be cutting edge. It'll be done instantly. In the name of Jesus. Touch my brother God and his grandchildren. Touch my brother grandson getting married next week God be with him that family that wife he's going to have God touch his, his uh, grandson in the service touch his boys bless his life God have your way Jesus <coughs> don't leave yet just hang on a second I'm going to let you go Oh, yes. How many believe what I preach to be the truth? Hang on a second, folks. You're going to go in about two minutes. People, I would just like to say I'm embarrassed to be standing here saying this. Uh, 
that has come to my attention a lot. The Lord indirectly has brought it to me. I've been at this church about three years now, and y'all all remember when there wasn't hardly a service at Sunday school or whatever that I wasn't here. I have had a little illness lately, but I have to be honest, there have been a lot of services that I could have been here. God bless you. And it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Whatever reason, I hadn't backslid. I hadn't gone back out and sinned. I was just saying, it, that verse in uh, Revelations 2, 2, 3, whatever, uh, where it says, uh, because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And I felt like the Lord gave that to me as a warning. Not that I backslid on him, but if you don't, you need to get back, be there every service in Sunday school and all. And I, I just felt led to say it. Pray for me. This is a good man right here. Let me tell you something. Now, if he hadn't been here today, he wouldn't have heard this message. And if he hadn't heard this message, then he may not have felt what he's feeling right now. See? It's so important to be in the house of God because you're going to miss something. You're going to miss something. It might be just one little part of a message that I say that will carry you to another day, another week. You've got to have it. And we're faithful. We've got a good church. And I'm, I don't get up here and beat on you people. I just try to, in love, preach the truth. It's going to cut you sometime. And believe me, that sword flies out and jumps back on my hide too. I get cut preaching. We all do. Well, that's what it's supposed to. We're supposed to stay on the operating table. And God's supposed to examine us all the time. I went to the doctor the other day and they called me and they said, uh, you haven't had an appointment in a while. I said, I don't need it. I'm well. But I got to thinking. I said, well, I'm going to have an appointment. Just let them check me out because I know there's nothing wrong with me. But if I don't go, they, they may not want me when they need to go if I do. So I don't want to lose my doctor, but anyway, bless you. Have a good lunch. <laughs>